Um, so this is Hilton. He's the head of corporate development at Cisco, which means he's in charge of their mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and we're going to talk about the Internet of Things, or Internet of Everything, as Cisco calls it. But first, we're going to queue up a short video from Cisco on their vision for the Internet of Everything. 2014, it will be the tipping point. The effect of the first 25 years of the Internet, it'll be five to ten times that effect in the next decade. It is the vehicle which will allow you to address almost every problem that exists in the world. Where we are today is we have episodes or instances of dramatic change, but we're just seeing the beginning of it. The amount of data that's available to so many people has grown astronomically, and a lot of that data has an IP address. Less than 1% of all the things that could be connected are currently connected. What happens when it's 5%, 20%, 50% will connect more new things than we have in the entire internet history? It's people being aware of processes and those processes generating new data and insight that flow from things. The internet of everything brings these systems together. It's as if the world is going to reboot. We're rapidly creating a digital nervous system for the planet. When each of those levels of awareness increases, the number of people that are connected increases exponentially. The world becomes hyper-aware. That treasure trove of data, which is growing at a very rapid rate, is increasingly going to be analyzed. We are making things that were previously invisible, visible, and then we can start exploring solutions. It will completely transform the cities of the future. It will change traffic patterns, it will change parking, street lights will automatically dim, saving a huge amount of energy. There's sensors in the soil, there's sensors that are able to tell you what the weather is going to be. We are now able to see real-time information across the globe. Sensor-based information will allow the smaller farmer in remote parts of the world to be more efficient and more effective. Empowering those who really are at the fulcrum of the decision. The connectivity of all these devices will bring quality health care to everyone in the world. You, as an individual, become much more knowledgeable about your body. There are health-related sensors that are swallowable. Sensors within the body that see fever spike in an area, well, that might be an indication that malaria is an outbreak. As we get more and more patterns from more and more patients, we'll be able to find and cure diseases more quickly. Our most precious resource is, is our people. We need a world where everybody is a creative problem solver with a deep understanding of multiple subject areas. And also change the mindset around education, that education is not an event anymore. Education is a process that's going to propel them to actually go out and attack the most challenging problems that we face. The currency of the 21st century is all about insight. Every individual on this planet has something to add value. We just uncovered the key to unlock that value. That's what the Internet of Everything does. The success of the Internet of Everything will be measured by how it changed every aspect of humanity for everyone in the world. Okay, so that was a brief introduction to Cisco's high-level vision for the Internet of Everything. So I know that uh, Cisco calls the Internet of Things the Internet of Everything. And one of the things that came up in that video is actually people and processes and not just things. So can you briefly explain that to us, what you mean by the Internet of Everything? It, it, this, is the key, this is the key element. And, and I think the, um, the expansion of the definition uh, by using the word everything to encompass people, processes, I would add to that experiences, fundamentally changes the paradigm from just assuming that everything that can have an IP address or can be represented digitally in the world that's flagged as a component or a node, uh, that the, that fact in and of itself is not, not as important as the fact that there are things that are happening as a result of those things being connected together. That in fact, you know, you go from this concept of nouns, a thing, to the concept of verbs, action. And the internet of everything, we believe, fundamentally, is going to transform the way that we live, learn, work, and play. That's been our motto for a long time. But when you think about the, the network, the ability for these nodes now, whether it's a, a piece of equipment out in a field that's doing agriculture, or a, a person that's connected to a mobile device, uh, or a jet engine that's throwing off data, 
that the fact that you can take that data, analyze it, make real-time adjustments that ultimately add value, create safer experiences, and much more exciting uh, applications is really what the internet of everything is all about. So we're very excited for this next chapter and what is naturally a journey of where networking has come from and where it is going to go because this is, uh, this is going to be a transformational time, I think, for, for humans on the planet because of this, this evolution. So it seems like the internet of the ideas behind the internet of things and some of the technology has actually been around for a while. But suddenly this year, we've gone on the kind of upslope of the hype cycle. So what do you think some of the main drivers behind that are? It's a good question. Um, you know, if I take a step back and I consider uh, some of the things that we've known to be true for, for a long time, and you think about where the, the basics of data connectivity have, uh, have affected all of us over the last 20 years and where things are going now, you know, the same fundamental drivers continue to be true, right? That the value of the network is proportionally uh, related to the number of nodes on that network. And that's basically Metcalfe's law. I think that most of the people in this room understand that. And when you consider the fact that internet of everything presumes, right, that there are going to be 50 billion things connected by the year 2020, you know, that's a lot of value that gets created. It's also a lot of destruction of value in other industries that don't necessarily uh, adjust to that, to that trend. So I think that the exponential connections and the growth of connections of the endpoints, the nodes, will actually create much more value. That's a major driver of the internet of everything. I think the second major piece, and you can see it in the numbers, uh, the processing power and the ability to analyze, to compute, uh, and to accelerate the, the set of applications that one can experience to be able to drive value, which I'll talk about in a second, you know, that, that very much follows the same paradigm that we've seen for a long time around Moore's Law. You know, you have effectively today 60 times more processing power uh, for the same density as 10 years ago. Uh, the cost of bandwidth is 1 40th of what it was 10 years ago. And these trends together fundamentally change the way in which this technology can be absorbed and the value that ultimately can be created as a result of it. And then lastly, the movement, and I think this has been true of a number of different uh, technology trends and shifts that have been long lasting, the movement towards standards. The ability for us to take what have been disparate processes that have been proprietary across multiple industries and domains and actually bring the value of IP right to those domains in single standards or sets of standards has allowed us to be able to proliferate uh, these solutions into the broader marketplace across multiple industries. But aren't standards actually going to be one of the big obstacles to this whole revolution of the internet of everything? Because there are kind of rival sets of companies that are trying to define the standards in this area? I, I think that um, ultimately, which is true of, uh, of business uh, and the markets in general, uh, competing standards doesn't mean that uh, ultimately you don't get to something that people can, can agree on. I think that in fact, as we've seen time and time again, competing standards actually allow you to, to get to a better answer in the end, in my, in my view. You will have um, tugs of war and competition for some period of time, but ultimately the marketplace will decide where the greatest efficacy comes from. And, and they will decide based upon the benefits that they experience as a result of a standard uh, and some of these dynamics beginning to impact them. Those benefits really fall into three categories, right? They fall into the category of reducing cost. So whether it is in the form of being able to run a manufacturing process much more efficiently and reducing the, the ultimate uh, cogs for a business to consume a good to be able to then bring value to their end customers or increasing the efficiency of processes. And you know, we may or may not talk about how that impacts things like logistics uh, as well as uh, transportation uh, from the standpoint of, of aeronautics and the ability to make a much more efficient jet engine, for example. I mean, that amount of, of, uh, of efficiency gain uh, creates billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars of value 
uh, in the system and for, those, uh, for those, um, those companies that implement those solutions. And lastly, the ability to create new value, new applications that haven't even been imagined as a result of having these, um, these capabilities in place. What do you think the first mover industries will be <laughs> who will gain those benefits? Because this is not going to be, you know, the revolution is not going to be evenly distributed. Certain industries will move faster than others. So that's, um, you know, I, I think in the first instance, you're going to see a number of industries uh, who are leaning forward, uh, to use my term, to be able to embrace and engage this disruption in a way that simply makes their cost of doing business much lower and where those, um, those returns uh, on capital are going to be an investment are going to be most obvious. And when I think about that, the first set of industries uh, are, are around the ones I mentioned. I mean, clearly, if you look at manufacturing and shop floors, right, the ability to put a sensor, which you know, may have cost a $1.60 uh, five years ago, but now is you know, 60 cents, uh, which really is the, 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 the trend. I mean, more than, uh, more than half the reduction in the cost of being able to put IP onto an endpoint to understand what that, product, uh, what that product state is as it's moving through the manufacturing assembly line, uh, the tolerances and conditions that exist on that factory floor. It goes out the door. Uh, you can track a pallet, not just from the standpoint of where it is, but actually understand the state the temperature, um, the chemical composition of the air, all the things that fundamentally are going to be able to, to generate value in a very short amount of time for those who produce uh, and consume products. So I think clearly manufacturing, heavy industry, and logistics uh, represent a cluster of value creation in the marketplace. I, I think that you know, if you take a look at what GE has said, you know, what Jeff Immelt has come out and said around the 1% uh, improvement across a number of their, their industries, you know, a 1% improvement in the efficiency of a jet engine creates hundreds of billions of dollars potentially of value for the airlines over, over time. And when you think about that, you know, whether it's the real-time adjustment of how an airplane flies, how it consumes uh, fuel, uh, or I think more fundamentally, uh, the, the convincing argument that aircraft are not going to be designed, uh, nor are jet, jet engines going to be designed the same way in the future because of the data that you now have available to you. Uh, you know, that's clearly another industry where we're going to see uh, the ability to drive real value innovation early. Uh, and in terms of transportation, as an example, you take uh, Nor Norfolk Suff uh, Southern in the US, which is a, 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 a big railway um, uh, service company. Yeah, the, the, rail, the railways can generate significant amounts of value by being able to improve the safety but also the speed and performance of, uh, of, of their vehicles on the, on the rail. So if you improve uh, a train by one mile per hour uh, in terms of speed safely, you know, that's $200, million, $200 billion a year for a company like Norfolk. So those are the industries where we see things going first. But you know, maybe to take a step back on that, um, if those are the obvious ones, I think that the, the really exciting thing about IOE and IOT is the fact that many of the applications that we will all take for granted in 10, 15, 20 years don't even exist. And let me give you an example. So some of you may be familiar with Steven Johnson, the, um, the journalist and um, sort of futurist. Uh, you know, he talks about, in his more recent book, How We Got To, to Now, which uh, is, is not about how I flew into to Vienna to be on this stage, but how we got to this place in the history of innovation. He talks a lot about the unintended consequences of technology. And when you, when you take an example, a fundamental example, like the printing press, um, you know, most people in the room would presume that the value of the printing press was the fact that you could take the knowledge uh, of certain ideas, certain processes, and scale those very quickly across great expanses of time and space, uh, as well as uh, obviously the geographies that you know, a book could travel. Yeah, that's great, right? Obviously, it revolutionized the way that we think 
the way that we communicate and the ability to absorb and to educate ourselves uh, and to be able to take the, the society forward. At the same time, that innovation actually kicked off a whole slew of other innovations that were related to the fact that most people realized that you know, humans had evolved to be able to see very far away the threats that were coming at us. And looking at a book actually forces you uh, to start thinking about how you solve for the fact that most people are farsighted, right? So technology around lenses uh, was created and proliferated as a result of the printing press and ultimately led to looking at very, very small things through mic microscopes. And so, again, completely unintended consequence of that technology. And I suspect, just like um, the printing press, in IOE, you're going to have industries, again, like um, manufacturing, transport, and aeronautics that are obvious today, but they will give birth to new industries in the future as things increasingly are connected and the data that comes out of those things can be applied to different applications. So, in fact, this is quite a different narrative from what you see in a lot of the press about Internet of Things, which tends to focus a lot on wearables and consumer. So you're, t you're saying the first industries to Im be impacted by this are more manufacturing logistics, like what GE calls the industrial internet, I suppose. Yep. And then they will give birth to a whole new set of completely new applications that we don't even know about yet. And related to that, what do you think the biggest misconceptions are about the Internet of Things? I think that um, from a is this mic? okay so I, I think that um, most of us have gone through uh, the last couple of years and sort of seen the proliferation of wearables in the marketplace and you know we talked about heavy industry and the application uh, within heavy industry I think one of the biggest misconceptions of IOE is that it's sort of those those two bookends it's either heavily consumer focused or it's all about the shop floor. And, and I think the reality is that over time what we're going to see is that Internet of Things and Internet of Everything will be pervasive. That our our day-to-day -day lives, just like they've been transformed by mobility and the fact that you can take a mobile device and interact with a cloud to get uh, anything, anytime, anywhere that you want it, that that concept of pervasiveness of technology that we've come to understand and accept in the world of mobility and smartphones and uh, both for productivity as well as entertainment will translate to very similar changes and shifts, massive shifts that are pervasive in the IOE realm. So the things in the physical world that you experience every single day as an enterprise um, uh, employee or as an entrepreneur uh, or as a consumer in that persona, that all those things are actually going to be transformed by IOE, and you know that's going to go f uh, for the ability for you to, to traverse a city without uh, hitting any traffic in the future, which I think uh, will be the case at some point in time, uh, to the ability to have you know, your connected life uh, available in a way that you want it to the people that you want to communicate with on a real-time basis without having to search. You know, the, the machine learning capabilities of IOE and IoT will endemically provide that for you. So if Internet of Things is going to be pervasive and is going to change how we live our everyday lives, what are the risks associated with that? Because we've already talked about some of the benefits. Yeah. Well, I think that there are the same risks in a sense that have, have always plagued uh, new innovation anywhere uh, in any time in human history, which is that any time you create a, a new value for something, a new experience, uh, you create new vulnerabilities. And I think uh, this is no different. Very clearly, as the uh, PC separated from, um, uh, from a network uh, was uh, something that was relatively safe, uh, if unstable, when you connected it to the network, it was then exposed to malware. Uh, and then obviously we've seen that become much more mature and intelligent over time. Security is obviously one of the major concerns that one would have. And when you think about the nature of threats today, so forget about the, um, the, the, the natural vulnerabilities that will occur from theft uh, and from vandalism, it's really about nation states at this point. Uh, as you go into the IOE world, the fact that exploits and, uh, and nation states 
are the sources of, of many exploits, the ability for you to protect critical infrastructure, right? So IOE is relevant to the utility space. It's relevant for transportation, as I said, uh, for power generation. Uh, so I think all of those spaces are, are very natural vulnerabilities. The ability to then apply security to IOE and to make sure that you have a, a regime that deals with those threat vectors is one of the clear threats and, um, and concerns that, that one has and finding the right solutions and capabilities to, to address that uh, is something that we're very focused on. I think that that's true in privacy as well. If that's the classic view of security, which is um, you know, getting access to something you're not supposed to have access to and doing bad things with it, you know, privacy uh, at the individual level is also something that's critically important. The more sensors there are in the world, uh, very clearly beyond just your mobile device knowing where you are, a lot of other people and things can know exactly where you are uh, for good purposes and also for very bad purposes. And I think that is a, a major concern that we have. And again, you know, there are, um, as I said, un unintended consequences from a positive perspective. The thing that I worry about is very clearly the things that can happen uh, on the negative side as well. So security and then obviously negative, uh, negative consequences coming from IOE. But again, that's the opportunity as well. People in this room, uh, people around the world who are innovators, entrepreneurs, um, I am confident will attack that problem and the value of, uh, of solving it. And, um, and we'll get there together, obviously, through, through some ups and downs. But that's the, that's the promise of IOE, which is to create the opportunities for new, uh, new value, but also uh, to solve for, for the vulnerabilities as well. And are we going to have to create completely new techniques, for example, to secure Internet of Things? Because you have stuff like critical infrastructure, like power stations, which tended not to have security because they weren't connected to the open Internet. Yeah. And then you have the everyday devices, like if we're going to have smart homes, we're going to have yeah. self-driving cars, etc., which can be taken hold of. But we have techniques for updating servers, for updating mobile phones, but we don't necessarily have you know, patching and, yeah. and so on. But we don't necessarily have those same techniques yet for the internet of things which are going to be part of our everyday lives. So you think part of the opportunity here for startups is going to be to come up with some of the, those techniques or parts of that infrastructure? I think that's a massive opportunity. I think just as in the traditional world of network vulnerabilities um, and endpoint security where the idea that, okay, here was an attack, you know what that looked like, let's go and stamp out a signature, download that or upload it um, to be able to, to put a patch on a network or on an endpoint device, you know, that actually doesn't work today as well. I mean, I, that we know the world is going to a place in which um, the sophistication of attacks is such that you have to be much more behavior-based in what you do. And I think that plays very well to the kinds of solutions that need to be de developed for Internet of Everything, that because you're going to have uh, a pervasive uh, endpoint-based, sensor-based uh, infrastructure that's going to be ubiquitous, you know, the, the network itself will have to, on the fly, adjust, have much more intelligence, and be able to understand anomalies, detect them, uh, use the data that it understands about known threats, uh, but also apply different heuristics to be, being able to solve the problem. I mean, I would submit that, uh, in a way, the fingerprint, the granularity of the fingerprint of what should be happening at a particular point in time and what somebody has the permission to do should actually provide an opportunity to have better security, in a sense. You know, I think it's when you don't have a lot of information um, and there are, you know, blunt force instruments like, um, you know, I've got a password that I've stolen and now I'm applying it. You know, that's, that, you know, that's a key exchange problem in today's paradigm. Tomorrow, I think understanding what someone's behavior is, contextually understanding where they are as they're engaging in that behavior and what permissions they have as they enter into uh, that environment, virtually or physically, will give rise, I actually think, to a much more compelling and um, effective means by which to protect ourselves at some point. You know, again, it, it will be a journey along the way, but I do think, to your question, we are going to have to do things differently, and when we do, I think it'll be better. Okay. So, for example, we could be detecting threats or attacks using data analysis and then coming up with completely new techniques of how we actually protect these kinds of devices. On the privacy side, um, so you talked about permissions. 
So do you think that people will start giving permissions, will start having to set permissions about what, you know, what data devices in their smart home can share and with whom? And is that going to turn into a kind of nightmare scenario of Facebook privacy settings crossed with mobile app permissions on steroids? And will consumers even really understand it? I, I, think, I think simplicity um, tends to win the day. And I think the more an individual or a company has to do to set specific policies, the harder things actually get. But I think that I think that IOE actually has the potential to allow individuals and companies to think not in terms of policy anymore, but in terms of outcomes. You know, what do you want the outcome to be? I want the outcome to be that Hilton has the ability uh, to communicate with Kara in this way and exchange this kind of information. Um, and, they, and that's a trusted relationship no matter where you are and that everything around you, all the infrastructure that sits around you, that you have on you, enforces that. And you know, it, it takes you away from having to set individual technology preferences and goes towards the result, which is your experience and what you're trying to, to gain. So. Okay, so thank you very much, Hilton. And thank you to the audience for listening to us. Great, thank you. And, okay. Thank you.